let me introduce uh, our next speaker. Um, so uh, Ben Galloway is uh, doing his PhD at the University of Colorado at Boulder in uh, atomic, molecular, and optical physics. He did his practicum at Lawrence Livermore in 2014 with Felice Albert and Bradley Pollock. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, lasers. Absolutely. Uh, I don't want to talk about the title. <laughs> Well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to be telling you about the work that I've been doing as an SSGF fellow. But before I get started on that, I would just like to take a minute to say thank you. Uh, thank you to the fellowship, to the DOE, the NNSA, of course, the Krell Institute. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all of the fellows and alumni when I say that this really is the best fellowship. It's made my life way easier than it would have been, and it's opened up so many opportunities for us all, so thank you. All right, so let me get started on my topic, which is high harmonic generation. And it's this process that happens in the field of laser physics. So if you like lasers, you'll be in for a treat. And if you don't, well, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I've been studying high harmonics with the Captain Mernin group at CU Boulder. And uh, the KM group focuses mainly on high harmonic generation and its applications. So um, I'll be telling you about that today. This is the outline for my talk. Um, I'll be telling you what exactly high harmonic generation is and why anyone would care about it. And then I'll be telling you uh, about my subtopic, which is harmonics driven by mid-infrared laser light, and then the limitations of that. And then I'll also talk about this really cool application called coherent diffractive imaging which is a microscopy technique that we use our harmonics for. So let's get started. What is high harmonic generation? Well, like I said, it's in the field of laser physics. So we start with a really intense laser, as you can see. And uh, in the KM group, we st use uh, titanium sapphire lasers, so 800 nanometers. And they uh, have ultra short pulses, so tens of femtoseconds in duration. So we have this intense laser, and we shine it into a system. And what we get out of that system is a weaker laser. Now, if that was the whole story, that would be pretty lame. <laughs> but what I didn't tell you is that we start with light that is in the visible or infrared regions of the spectrum. And the light that we get out is drastically different in color. It's in the extreme ultraviolet or x-ray regions. Now that, hopefully, you think is not lame. <laughs> so uh, high harmonic generation is a frequency conversion process. And uh, so who cares about high harmonics? Why would anyone care about it? Well, EUV and X-ray light, as I'm sure you're all aware of, acts differently than the IR light that we start with. Uh, you can see on the right side of this slide uh, transmission curves of some materials and metals and you can see that in some regions of the spectrum, there is very high transmission. So our X-ray photons could go right through these materials. There's also absorption edges. And so if we have a material and we shine our harmonics at that and we see absorption edges, we could figure out, oh, this is titanium, for instance, if we didn't know that in the first place. And then also, the beam that we get out is laser-like. So that means it has coherence properties that make it applicable to experiments that need lasers. Some of those applications are shown here. This, these are just a few examples. Uh, what we can do is study attosecond optics and physics and the dynamics of electrons at those attosecond timescales. We can also look at ultra-fast molecular dynamics, so how the electrons are bound to molecules and what their momentum states are on the ultra-fast timescales. Uh, we can also do imaging, and I'll talk more about coherent diffractive imaging later in the talk. And then we can also look into the materials property, properties um, of maybe materials that have a nanoscale topology on them and how heat transport might work in those materials. So these are just a few applications, but how does high harmonic generation relate to stewardship science? Well, back when I started this fellowship and applied for it, I had suggested that we could use high harmonics to probe warm, dense plasma. 
which is present in these really high energy experiments like at the NIF and whatnot. Now that state of matter is really strange and it's hard to model because of these high densities and couplings involved. And so I was hoping that high harmonics could be used to inform our models and make them better. So the idea would be to shine a laser at a target and create a warm, dense plasma on the surface. And then at some later time, come in with our harmonic beam and probe that plasma and do this in perhaps a time-resolved way or a spectrally resolved way. And that way we could learn about the state of matter as it's changing in time. Now, is high harmonic generation the only path to perform this experiment? Well, the answer is no. I'm sure you're very aware of all of the laser-like X-ray sources that are out there. There's these facility scale sources like synchrotrons and FELs, and they are awesome. They emit very bright, harmo or not harmonics, but X-ray light, much brighter than what we can uh, produce with our harmonic source. And um, I guess the only thing I would say about those facility scale sources is although they are great, they're a little bit less accessible to your average scientist uh, than our source. Like for instance, I have 24 seven access to an X-ray beam and I can do all kinds of riskier experiments just without even worrying about whether they'll fail or not. So um, that's pretty, pretty uh, empowering. And I think um, despite the pros and cons of all of these technologies, I would say they're very complementary to one another. Okay, so I left you with a very, very brief explanation of what high harmonic generation is. Let me go into the details of how it works. So this is the picture I left you off with. And the question is, what is in that black box? Well, high harmonic generation is a harmonic process. So we have a starting laser with its starting frequency, and then we generate harmonics of that frequency. In the photon picture, what we have is this, where we have a bunch of photons in the driving laser and we add up all their energies to then emit a single photon of the harmonic beam. But how does that work? What is the medium for that process? It's simply atoms. We shine our laser into a gas and the uh, laser interacts with the electrons in those atoms. And then the laser ionizes the electrons, accelerates them in the laser field, out and then back, and then the electron recollides with the ion, and in this process can emit an X-ray photon. We call this the three-step model. And here's another picture of that. Now our, our laser field is oscillating, and at first the laser field distorts the Coulomb potential that the electron sees. And the electron is able to tunnel ionize out of the well that it was sitting in and accelerate in the direction of the laser field. But the laser field oscillates and reverses sign, so the electron then turns around and comes back towards the ion. And if the electron comes near the ion, there is a chance for it to recombine and release any extra energy that it could have gained while it was out in the laser field. And that energy is released in the form of a photon. But that was the single atom picture, and in reality, we have a lot of atoms what we like to do in the KM group is start with this hollow capillary, fill it with gas, lots of gas atoms, and then shine our laser through it. And that allows our laser to interact with a lot of potential emitters of harmonics. And if we can get a lot of emitters, we can get a very bright harmonic beam out. But the trick is that we need all of those emitters to be emitting their photons in sync with one another, working together to create a very bright beam. And so we have to satisfy this condition called phase matching to make that happen. And long story short, we have knobs on our experiment that we can tune to make this always give us a bright harmonic beam out. However, the phase matching condition places some limitations and constraints on the uh, photon energies that we can achieve. So how hard of x-rays that we can get up to. Um, there's some equations here. And you can look at them and care about them if you want, but the main one I want to point out here is that if you want to reach higher energy photons, we have a, a route to do so through the scaling law 
you have to increase your driving laser wavelength. So lambda to the 1.6 is how the cutoff photon energy scales. All right, so now I'll tell you about driving harmonics with mid-IR light, which is going that direction towards longer wavelengths. These are some results that we've achieved. I'm showing you four spectra of harmonics driven by different colors. So the yellow on the left is driven by just the titanium sapphire laser, and that's 800 nanometers. And then we've got 1.3 microns, 2 microns, and then close to 4 microns is that big purple curve. And uh, you can see that it goes out to about 1.6 kiloelectron volts, which means our harmonics at those photon energies have wavelengths less than 1 nanometer, which is impressive because we were driving the process with light that had 4 micron wavelength. In essence, what we're doing is we're adding up more than 5,000 photons from the driving laser to spit out one photon in the soft X-ray region. Now, that's pretty awesome, in my opinion. And uh, this was done before I even joined the CAM group. And it really got me interested in seeing how far we could push the process to higher and higher photon energies. So um, what I did was uh, looked at this scaling law. Now, my goal was to get to the hard x-rays. That's what I wanted to do, because that light is really useful for a lot of applications. But to get to, say, 10 keV, that means we have to use a 10 or 20 micron uh, dr driving laser to drive the process. And the question in my mind was, do harmonics still work at these long wavelengths? And there was one particular reason why I thought they might not work and that was the magnetic Lorentz force. So that's QV cross B, as I'm sure you're all aware of. Charged particles get deflected by magnetic fields. And remember, our driving laser has a magnetic field. So it was that magnetic field that I was worried about. Remember the three-step process, where we have an electron, we want it to ionize, go out and back, and return to the ion. Without, without a magnetic field, that's fine and dandy. We can get that to work. But with a magnetic field, it could actually miss the ion. And therefore, there's no chance for harmonics to be emitted. It turns out that this V cross B drift uh, pushes the electron in the forward Z direction, which is the laser propagation direction. And that will be important later. Um, so you can calculate the drift and wonder, OK, is this a lot of drift? Is this enough to make the electron miss the ion? And to approach this problem, you have to think of the electron as a quantum particle. So the electron has a wave function. And when it's bound to the atom, that wave function is very tight and confined. But the second it gets ionized, it doesn't feel any more confining Coulomb potential. So the wave function is free to disperse. And by the time it returns to the ion, it's possible for the electron wave function to be very, very broad on the order of nanometers in size. And so what we really want to do is compare that size to the drift that might occur. And that's our uh, telltale signature of whether the electron will miss or not. Turns out, back in 2006, someone already did this. And um, so I looked at their paper and saw, oh, OK, so they tried it for three microns and saw that it moved two nanometers away, but the wave function was just super broad, so recollision could happen. But in their six micron case, it didn't look like that would work. But I looked deeper into this and saw that they were using some assumptions. They were using a plane wave laser field, which means that there are only two components to the laser field, EY, the electric field in the Y direction, and BX. Now, usually that's fine, but that assumes that your laser is infinite in extent. But in reality, we have this Gaussian beam that might be like a centimeter large, and then we focus that to something like hundreds of microns. So that's not at all a plane wave laser. And additionally, the intensities that they were using in this paper were way higher than were relevant to high harmonic generation. So what I wanted to do was look at this on my own, do my own analysis under the conditions that were relevant to the process that I cared about. So what I did is I looked at the electric field and magnetic field of a Gaussian beam in a focus, and that's what I'm showing you here. You can see EY in the vertical direction, 
you can see BX is in and out of the screen, and they oscillate with the wavelength, which are these like purple lobes. But when you have a tight focus, you actually end up getting another component, the EZ component, which has like this strange two lobe structure. And it's positive in one half and negative in the other half of the laser mode. So you can see that in these green lobes in this figure. Now the interesting thing about the, the EZ field is that it would tend to push the electron in the Z direction, the same direction as the V cross B force. And now you might think, okay, so the drift from both of these combined would cause the electron to really miss. But the EZ field is positive in, in one half and negative in the other half. So it could actually happen that the drifts cancel and you end up getting perfect recollision. And it turns out that all of those cases occur in this same laser mode. So I calculated the drifts as a function of X and Y of the laser mode, and this is what I got. You can see the EZ drift has this two-lobed structure, forward and backward. The V cross B drift is only forward, and then when you add them up, you get a total drift profile that looks like that. And from that profile, and knowing how the electron had dispersed, you can calculate whether or not the um, harmonics will be effi emitted efficiently. And so that's what this last plot is showing. Anywhere that there's orange on that plot, that means that the uh, harmonic process, the recollision process, will happen with, as if there were no drift at all. But then there's this purple region where it just really missed. So there will be no harmonics emitted in that spot. But I did this calculation for 10 microns, and I also did it for 20 microns and got similar results. And so the main point from this analysis, it just shows that yes, you can get some harmonics out. They might be reduced a little bit from a mode perspective, but you should still be able to see hard x-rays. And so this was an optimistic result. And we published that last year. All right, I'm gonna switch gears now to the coherent diffractive imaging part of my, part of my talk, um, which I told you before was a microscopy technique, but it's unique because it doesn't use any lenses at all. Typically in microscopy, a lens is used to form an image of the sample to the detector. But here we just shine our harmonic beam on the sample and measure the diffraction pattern. And from that diffraction pattern, you can reconstruct what the sample must have been to create the, the pattern that we're observing. Now the detector measures the intensity of the diffraction pattern, but it loses all of the phase information that is important for reconstructing what the object was. So we have to do some tricks. We have to plug the data into an algorithm and recover that phase that was lost. That algorithm basically runs like this. We iterate between the diffraction plane and the sample plane by using Fourier transforms. So we take our data, Fourier transform to the sample plane, and we get some bad image of the uh, sample. It, usually it doesn't even look that good. Um, but what we know in this sample plane is something about the sample. We might know that it's isolated. So we can apply constraints in this plane and say, oh, everything outside of the sample area is zero. And that helps to improve the reconstruction when we go back to the diffraction space. Now when we Fourier transform back to the diffraction space, the amplitude's different from what we measured. But there's some phase information there that wasn't there before. So what we do is we keep the phase and replace the amplitude. And then we just go through over and over and over. And the error ends up reducing and the phase gets better and better and we retrieve it if the algorithm converges, which if the constraint was a good constraint and um, you, know, you, know, you know a lot about the sample, then you can get a very nice image out. So our output is a nice image. Uh, we ended up applying this to um, look at a zone plate, and we did it in this rastering form of CDI called tychography. So we can basically look at a very large area of the zone plate all at the same time. Now a zone plate is a microstructured optic that is used like a lens for x-rays. But in this situation, we weren't using it like a lens. We were just trying to image the microstructure that was there. So we diffracted off of it. 
And this is what we ret re uh, retrieved. You can see the SEM image on the left and our reconstruction on the right. And long story short, we started with 13.5 nanometers to illuminate the object, and we got a resolution of 12.6 nanometers. So sub-wavelength resolution, which is, by the way, 12.6 nanometers is a record for any tabletop optical microscope. So this was a really cool result, and it was published just a few months ago. And I was hoping that now that we're really good at this, we could use this to investigate the warm, dense plasma, like I had originally started out to do. Um, and I think we're pretty close to doing that. OK, so just in summary here, I'll, I told you uh, about high harmonic generation, how it works, and what the limitations of that are. And I told you about this really cool uh, diffraction measurement that we retrieved this really high resolution, sub-wavelength resolution image of an interesting sample. And we plan to use this as a probe for warm, dense matter. Um, before I end, I would just like to again thank the fellowship for all the support. Also thank my advisors and my whole team and the other sources of funding and the collaborations that we have that have helped with these experiments. And I'd like to thank you for listening.